In this sermon, Pastor David considers John 1 14-18, and how we can't know God, or even see Him on our own, but Jesus reveals the Father to us. Lord, we know that on our own strength we are hopeless. Even in this time, as we open your word, Lord, we ask you to help us to humble ourselves before it. Help us to expectantly listen to the word, waiting for what you would say to us. Show us things that we need to change. Spirit, come and convict us. Lord, help me. Help me not to stumble in what I say. Help me to proclaim the word of the Lord with clarity. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. I wonder if any of you have ever been to an unveiling. An unveiling is kind of like a, a premiere. It's, it's the ancient form of the grand opening. It's when you get to see something for the very first time. So, for example, with a statue, the artist would finish the statue, and everyone would come to the big party, the big gathering, but the statue, you couldn't see it because it was, it was covered over. There was this, this sheet, this veil that uh, kept it out of sight until the appropriate moment when it would be unveiled, when, when the the cloth would be taken off, and now everyone could see the statue for what it was. There'd probably be applause at that moment, right? I want you to think about that image this morning. As long as as the cover, the veil remains, we we don't know what's underneath. We can't see it. It's, It's hidden. This morning, I want to talk to you about something that's incredible, something that you can't see. So again, turn with me to John's gospel. I'm going to read the the prologue, the introduction, the first 18 verses of John's gospel. This is the word of the Lord, God's holy, perfect, inerrant, and infallible word. In the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through him, and without him was not anything made that was made. In him was life, and the life was the light of men. The light shines in the darkness, and the the darkness has not overcome it. There was a man sent from God whose name was John. He came as a witness to bear witness about the light that all might believe through him. He was not the light, but he came to bear witness about the light, the true light, which gives light to everyone, was coming into the world. He was in the world, and the world was made through him, yet the world did not know him. He came to his own, and his own people did not receive him. But to all who did receive him, who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God, who were born, not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. And the word became flesh and dwelt among us. And we have seen his glory. Glory is the only son of the father, full of grace and truth. John bore witness about him. He cried out, this is he of whom I said, he who comes after me ranks before me, for he is before me. He was before me. From his fullness, we have all received grace upon grace. For the law was given through Moses, grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. No one has ever seen God. The only God who is at the Father's side, he has made him known. This is the word of the Lord. Here in these first few verses, John introduces his gospel. He's he's giving us just a taste of the major themes he's going to cover in the book. In verse 10, he drew our attention to a problem. Look there again with me. Speaking of Jesus, he says, he was in the world and the world was made through him, yet the world did not know him. Here we have a a problem introduced. We don't know our maker. Why were we created? What's the reason that we were made? Well, the Bible answers to know God. That's why you were made. You were made to know God, to be in a relationship with him. And so the aim of our life should be to know God. 
ever more so. What higher, more exalted, more excellent thing could we chase after? What a better goal than to know the one true living God. The prophet Jeremiah tells us this. This is Jeremiah 9, verse 23. He says, thus says the Lord, let not the wise man boast in his wisdom. Let not the mighty man boast in his might. Let not the rich man boast in his riches. So pause there for a minute. Here we're told that you're not to boast. And, and what are we not to boast in? Well, not in our, our insight, our wisdom, not in, in our, our power, our might, or not in our riches. I mean, isn't this what we commonly are prideful of? People are so proud of what they know, of, of what they have. Jeremiah gives us the word of the Lord that tells us this is not what we should be proud of. This is not what we should boast in. But he continues. But let him who boasts, boast in this, that he understands and knows me. This is what we should be excited about. This is what we should boast about. I know the Lord. Now to know a location, like a street corner, doesn't take much knowing, right? I mean, you're acquainted with it. You've been there once before. You're like, oh yeah, I know that corner. Now, to know an animal, now that takes more time, right? You're gonna spend some time, but eventually you can get to know the, the patterns, the behavior of that little dog or that horse or whatever. But to know a person, now this takes much more time. You see, people, they keep secrets, right? I mean, you can... You can know someone, you can be acquainted with them for a long time, and yet, I mean, years could go by, but you could say, I really don't know them. Imagine that you had the opportunity to meet the president. Now, whether you like the president or not is really not the issue here, but think about the office of the president, right? You've been invited to meet the president of the United States. This would be a great honor. But imagine when you were there that the president, he said, Oh, tell me more, and, and wanted to get to know you and kept drawing you out and asking questions and sharing intimate details of his life, and you actually developed a close personal friendship. Boy, that would be a much greater honor. Oh, to know someone of such stature. But Jeremiah is telling us here, how much greater to know your maker, to know God, to know the sustainer of the universe. There could be nothing better than to know God. My goal this morning is simple. I want you to be able to leave here rejoicing in the fact that we actually can know God. It's possible to know God. And that's all of grace. That's a kindness of God. It is possible to know God. And yet what we're told here is that by nature, humanity does not know God. We are separated from God. We are, we are blind to him. We are cut off and isolated. We have no access. We cannot see him. God, by very nature, is invisible. He dwells in unapproachable light. And yet we live in darkness. Last time we looked at how John uses darkness to describe the evil, wicked, godless behavior of humanity. It's not only that we can't see God. We're not even looking for him. Not on our own. We naturally reject God and rebel against his authority. Even God's chosen people, when you, when you walk through the scriptures, you think the Old Testament and even into the New, they have this pattern of rejecting God. Look at verse 11 in our passage. He came to his own, and his own people did not receive him. If anyone would have received him, it should have been at least his people, and yet they too rejected him. But our God is full of grace. Look at verse 12. But to all who did receive him, who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God. Now, how can that happen? How can we come into his family? Talk about knowing God to be in a familial relationship. How is it that we can dwell with God and be with God, especially when we have the first half of verse 18? Verse 18 starts this way. No one has ever seen God. You can't do it. You can't see God. This is the massive problem that we are struck with this morning. How can we know God if we can't even see him? How, 
can we know God? Now, the fact that we can't see God isn't just in this passage. It's throughout the Bible. Let me give you a few examples. Paul, when he's writing to Timothy, in the first chapter of that letter, says this. This is chapter 1, verse 17. To the king of the ages, immortal, invisible, the only God, be honor and glory forever. Amen. There he's describing, this is just part of who God is. He is invisible. In the closing chapter, chapter 6, verse 16, he says this. God, who alone has immortality, who dwells in unapproachable light. I mean, can you imagine? The light's just so bright you can't go towards it. He dwells in unapproachable light, whom no one has ever seen or can see. To him be honor and eternal dominion. Amen. So he's rejoicing. He's worshiping this God who we can't see. Later, John will write in his letter, 1 John 4, verse 12, that no one has ever seen God. Again and again and again, the scripture tells us we can't see God. Well, why not? Why can't we see God? Well, on the most simple level, because God is a spirit. He doesn't have a body. He is by nature invisible. He's he's different from us. That's true. But there's a more fundamental reason why we can't see God. Ultimately, we cannot see God because he is holy and we are not holy. In the passage that was read for us earlier, Moses asked to see God's glory. Show me your glory. Here's what God said in response, Exodus 33, verse 20. You cannot see my face, for man shall not see me and live. You see, for us to see holy God would mean our destruction. He is a just God, a righteous God who punishes sin. For sinners to try and gaze upon him would mean certain death. You cannot look upon me and live. When we get to Isaiah chapter 6, these angels, they cover their eyes and they cry out, holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. In the book of Hebrews chapter 12 verse 28, we read this, let us offer to God acceptable worship with reverence and awe. For our God is a consuming fire. What an image. Our God is a consuming fire. Is that how you regularly perceive God? Is that how you think about him? Is that how you view God? I love the first line of A.W. Tozer's little book, The Knowledge of the Holy. Here's how he starts it. He says, what comes into our minds when we think about God is the most important thing about us. It's a pretty bold statement. What comes into your mind when you think about God is the most important thing about you. That's because if we have a distorted view of God, we perish. We can't have a wrong view of God. We must know the true God. So the real question is, is your view of God the right one? Are you you seeing things rightly? Now, when I I say the view of God, what people think and understand about God, they probably fall into these four categories. Here's the first of four categories. There's those who seem to have no view of God. That is, they ignore him. They say there is no God. It's mistaken. It's the wrong view. And yet, there's there's those who hold to that view. Secondly, there are those who have a, a false view. Now, the first one's also false. But what I'm trying to describe here is there are those who they believe something that's just obviously wrong about God. These are distortions. Things like God is everything or I am God. Those are just false statements. And the world's religions is filled with these statements. Yes, they believe in God. They're theists. And yet they have a distorted view of God. Charles Spurgeon, the great preacher said this, the quickest way to avoid error is to embrace truth. So what that means is, it's not that we need to know every detail about every distortion. What we need to know is the truth. I've been told of those who are learning to identify counterfeit bills, it works the same way. Sure, they have some familiarity with the ways people try to fake it, but what they really need to know is the intricacies of the real deal. Show me what an actual bill looks like. And so it is with us. We need to know the word. 
Brothers and sisters, we need to be a people of the book. We need to read our Bibles. In the newsletter, the last page is a Bible reading plan. I hope many of you have decided to use that. If you've never read through the whole Bible, this is the year you can do it. This is a doable task to read and become familiar with what God has said. Let me encourage you, read the word. All right, third view, those with a small view of God. Now, this again is still mistaken. It's still a distortion, but these things are more subtle. They're they're not as, as obvious. People say, well, I guess this is God, but they think of him as kind of just the man upstairs, as a generous grandpa in the sky who who quickly dusts our sin under a rug. There's those who see God as not imposing much on them. God who wouldn't actually tell us what to do. He wouldn't make demands upon us. He wouldn't act as if he has a claim upon our lives. There are those who see Jesus as a a great savior, but, but they're not willing to submit to him as Lord. In his excellent book, Radical, the missions committee is reading this book together right now. David Platt writes this. In American Christianity, we are molding God into our own image. He's beginning to look a lot like us because after all, that's who we are most comfortable with. The danger is, as we gather in our church buildings to sing and to lift up our hands and worship, we're not actually worshiping the God of the Bible. Instead, we're worshiping ourselves. Oh, the dangerous tendency of of not getting what I understand about God from the Bible, but from just the culture around me, just making assumptions. Oh, we need to be careful that we're rooted in the word. So finally, the right view, the correct view, is the biblical view. Right? What does the Bible actually say? If we are to understand God rightly, we have to search the scriptures. And there we find that God is holy and just. He's righteous and wise. He's eternal. He's the creator, the sustainer. He's all powerful, all knowing, all wise. He sits above the circle of the earth. He stretches out the heavens like a curtain. This is our God. He's the sovereign one who does whatever he wants, whatever he chooses. No one can stop him. No one can thwart his plans. He is, as we heard, read earlier from Exodus 34, a God who is merciful and gracious, slow to anger, abounding in steadfast love and faithfulness, keeping steadfast love for thousands, forgiving iniquity and transgression and sin, but who will by no means clear the guilty. How does that fit together? Here he speaks of his justice. He will by no means clear the guilty. He's a righteous God who must punish sin. And yet he just said, like, I don't know, 10 different ways of saying that he forgives, that he's merciful, that he's gracious. How could he be merciful and just? This is how God describes himself near the beginning of the Bible. And then throughout the Bible, he's answering that question. He's helping us to understand how God can can be both page after page. The invisible God has revealed himself to us. Paul writes in Romans that he's revealed himself in creation, in the world around us. You see the stars and you say, wow, look at our maker. He has done this. So the heavens, they declare the glory of God. But more than that, God has revealed himself specifically in the Bible. So we must be people of the book. But that's not enough. Just knowing about God doesn't solve the problem. We still can't see him. We can't even truly know him. The book of Hebrews addresses this issue. This is the opening of the book of Hebrews, verse 1. Long ago, at many times, in many ways, God spoke to our fathers by the prophets. So he's saying, this is the Old Testament. God has spoken to us. But then he says this. But in these last days, God has spoken to us by his son. He goes on to describe the son. He says, he is the radiance of the glory of God. We can't even get our mind around what that means. He is the radiance of the glory of God, the exact imprint of his nature. This is the word that was used to describe what you would use to make a coin, this, this imprint, again and again, where they all match. He's saying he is the exact picture of God. So the invisible God, he's revealed himself through the Bible, but the invisible God has also revealed himself through his son. So 
this is the answer. This is the solution to the problem. Jesus shows us God. Jesus makes the Father known. And I want to spend the rest of our time this morning helping to understand how he does that. So let's review for a minute the beginning of our passage. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through him, and without him was not anything made that was made. So first, John makes it clear about the identity of the Word. This is a person, and this person is the eternal creator God. He goes on to say that he is God's own son. Verse 14, he says, And the word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we have seen his glory. Glory is the only son from the Father. So we couldn't get to God, so God came to be with us. In fact, he came to be one of us. This is what we celebrate every Christmas. But I want us to focus our attention on that little phrase, we have seen his glory. We've seen it. We have beheld in Jesus God. He shows us the glory of God. Again, this is what the author of Hebrews is after. Again, listen to verse 3. He is the radiance of the glory of God, the exact imprint of his nature. So Jesus reveals God to us. He shows us God. Here's how Paul put it in the book of Colossians. Rather provocatively, he writes, Jesus is the image of of the invisible God. Wait a minute. He's the picture of that which cannot be seen? Exactly. You've got it. He's showing us what we could never see. He's the image of the invisible God. God wants to be seen and known in his son. So that brings us back to verse 18 in our passage. No one has ever seen God. The only God who is at the Father's side, he has made him known So here, Jesus is identified as the only God who is at the Father's side. Now, the word only, this means the the unique, the one of a kind, the soul, the distinctive, the the only God. It's because there's only one God, and yet he's at the Father's side. Again, we delve into the mysteries of the Trinity. Just verse 1 said, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. So here... We have the only God who is at the Father's side. This introduction is bracketed with the deity of Christ. The Trinity is not a problem to solve. It's a reason to worship. Our one true God is triune. And Jesus, he makes the Father known to us. You see, our God is truly incomprehensible. And yet... He's knowable. We can't know him fully. He's beyond us, and yet we can know him truly. You can really know God, this God, the one true God. God has revealed himself in an utterly unique way by sending his son, Jesus. Jesus explains God to us. He answers the question, what is God like? Jesus is the ultimate disclosure of who God is. This is unprecedented revelation. God has manifested himself most clearly and supremely in Jesus. So if you hear Jesus teach, if you read his words, you're hearing God teach. If you come to know Jesus, you come to know God. When you watch Jesus in action, when you read of what he's done, you watch God in action. In Jesus, we see God. And don't think this is just something that's said about Jesus. Jesus said, that him, said this himself. So later we will get there eventually. But in John 14, verse 7, we read these words. Jesus speaking to his disciples, he says, If you had known me, you would have known my Father also. From now on you do know him and have seen him. Whoever has seen me has seen the Father. He's not claiming to be the Father, but he is claiming to be the perfect revelation of the Father. He reveals, he shows us God the Father. When you look at Jesus, you see God. Now, just pause there for a minute. For that statement to be said about anyone else is absolutely ridiculous. I mean, just imagine, you got a young girl, she's like, let me tell you about my new boyfriend. He's so cool. When you look at him, you see God. Whoa, we gotta help this young lady, right? I mean, this is... 
This is crazy talk. In fact, it has been said for someone to make such an incredible claim, to claim to be God, well, it only leaves us with three options. Either that person is a lunatic, they're crazy, or they're a liar, they're just not speaking the truth, or they are the Lord God. Those are the only three options. They are either deceived, deceiving, or they are divine. And that's exactly who Jesus is. He is the Lord God. You ask, well, how can we see the invisible God? And and John is raising his hand. I know, I know. Look at Jesus. Look to Jesus and you see God. But don't miss this. We're not given the Bible. We're not given all that we know about Jesus just so that we can study him. No, we are to savor him. He doesn't want to be analyzed. He wants to be adored. God is not merely here to be examined, but to be enjoyed. You see, God reveals himself to us that we might worship him, that we might know him in a personal relationship. So yes, come on Wednesday night to Bible study. Come to Sunday school. Read and memorize the scripture. Ponder it throughout the day. Discuss it with others. Read great books like this one, J.I. Packer's Knowing God. If you're not familiar with this book, this is pure gold. This is worth your time. Packer is an excellent guy. What he does is he, he introduces you to yet anew the glories of knowing God. He will make you hungry to read your Bible and worship more. Knowing God, J.I. Packer. Read good books like that one. Most of all, study your Bible. Learn as much as you can about God, but don't stop there. Don't just have knowledge of God. Knowing God is about far more than knowing about him. It's a matter of dealing with him, trusting him, worshiping him, obeying him, loving him. I have really good news this morning. You can know God, and more than that, you can be known by God. You can be in a relationship with him. Now, our relationship is naturally broken by our sin. Yet the Bible teaches that Jesus came to reconcile that relationship And that's really what verses 14 through 17 are about. So let's briefly see how they all fit together. Follow the flow of thought from verse 14. The word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we have seen his glory. Glory is the only son of the father, full of grace and truth. So here we're told that the word became flesh. God became man. He took on humanity. That which is infinite became finite. Eternity entered Time, the creator entered his creation. The invisible one became visible. Then in verse 15, John bore witness about him and cried out, this is he of whom I said, he who comes after me ranks before me because he was before me. Now, John the Baptist is actually older than Jesus, right? Like he was born six months older. This isn't simply a statement about how old Jesus's physical body was. No, no, he was recognizing the one who comes after me, he, he's the eternal one. And he ranks before me. That is, he is the most excellent one. John is testifying to the preexistence and the preeminence of Jesus. He was before and he is the best. Look at verse 16. For from his fullness, we have all received grace upon grace. So think of an ocean, how the waves just come again and again, one after another. Jesus' grace is abundant. It's like that. It just keeps coming. It cannot be stopped. You see, God first graciously and truthfully revealed himself in the Old Testament. But now, even more fully, he's revealed himself in his son. So Exodus 33, again, we heard this earlier. The Lord says, I will be gracious to whom I will be gracious God graciously revealed himself to Moses and to the prophets. But now, even more grace has been shown in Jesus. So look at verse 17. For the law was given through Moses. Grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. And the grace that Jesus is full of, the grace that we can receive, is the grace of the cross. You see, it's not only that Jesus came to be one of us, to relate with us, to to be known. More than that, it's that Jesus came in order to die in our place. 
You see, what separates us from God is our sin. What keeps the holy God hidden is our unholiness. The unseen God has revealed himself through the Bible by sending his son. But even more than that, God reveals himself by justly punishing sinners. You see, in Jesus, we get the most clear view of God. You see, God had to punish our sin. He will by no means clear the guilty. And so Jesus, as our substitute, took the punishment we deserve so that God could show himself to be both a just God who shows mercy. You see, at the cross, justice and mercy, they kiss. And there we have the most clear view of our God. Listen again to the well-known words of Romans 5.8. God shows his love for us, and that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. You see, Christ dying in the place of sinners is God showing his love to us. This is how we see God. It's the gospel of Jesus Christ that most clearly reveals God. So like unveiling a statue, Jesus unveils holy God, and he does so by removing our sin. He takes away our filth so that we can truly see holy God. The just and merciful God, the wrathful and loving God, the holy and gracious God, that God, the one true God, Jesus has made him known. That's the glory that John is drawing our attention here. You can never come to God independent of Jesus, but if you have Jesus, you have everything. He is showing you God himself. To know God is what we were made for. And because of Jesus' life, death, and resurrection, all who turn from their sin and trust in him, those who repent and believe, those who say, I'm not going to rely on my actions, my work anymore. I'm going to rely solely on what Jesus has done. Those people can receive grace upon grace. They can know God and be known by God. What Jesus has secured for us is this incredible privilege. You can know God. Jesus has made him known. Indeed, Lord, we have come to worship. To worship the God who has made himself known. Lord, we can leave here rejoicing because we can know you. On our own, we are blind to see you. In our unholiness, we deserve to be banished from your presence forever. And yet you have made a way for us to be in your family, for us to know you forever. Oh Lord, how we rejoice in the gospel, how we rejoice in what Christ has accomplished. Jesus has indeed made God known to us. Amen.